and welcome to On Point. I'm Monica Trousey. With me today is Janet McCabe, Senior Law Fellow at the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Janet is a former Acting Assistant Administrator for the Office of Air and Radiation at US EPA during the Obama Administration. Thank you for joining me. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Monica. Thanks for having me. So quite an about face on energy and climate since you left the government. Um, what is your assessment of the concrete steps we've seen so far from the Trump administration on climate? Well, on climate specifically, we're just seeing a lot of relooking at um, a variety of things that the, that the Obama administration did. Um, uh, reconsiderations, delays, revisiting, that sort of thing. Um, maybe the two biggest things that people have been noticing are uh, the decision to relook at the Clean Power Plan and to ask the D.C. Circuit to not go ahead and issue a decision, um, and the recent withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord. So on the Clean Power Plan specifically, if the Obama EPA had crafted a different rule um, or had maybe gone about the CPP differently, do you think we would still be in this position of the Trump administration trying to completely do away with the Clean Power Plan? Well, I think it's re reflective of deep divisions about how we approach climate and, um, and people's views about um, uh, whether EPA has a responsibility uh, to regulate in this area. And um, our, our view was we clearly did, uh, that the Supreme Court had found that CO2 uh, was a pollutant that was endangering public health and welfare. And that's, uh, sets a, that's what the Clean Air Act is supposed to do, is to protect people from that. So uh, we went about uh, 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 devising a rule using um, the, the, the standard approaches um, set forth in the Clean Air Act and many years of precedent applied to the particular industry, electric power industry, um, and uh, fully briefed it and argued it at the D.C. Circuit. Um, and uh, I don't know if we'll ever know what that court's view is on, on the job that we did, but I think we would have had these, um, these divisions likely anyway. Um an imperfect rule? Is it fair to say that it, it was not a perfect rule? Well, there are always things that, you, that, that people have different views on how you could do something on a rule, but um, I'm actually very, very proud of the job that EPA did on the rule, um, given uh, the importance of it, the significance of it. Uh, one, one thing I'm particularly proud of is how we engaged everybody. You know, I had hundreds of meetings, um, and so did many people in the Office of Air and Radiation, the administrator as well getting people's views and building those considerations in. And if you if you look at the changes that were made between the proposed rule and the final rule, how we really listened uh, to make this a, was a rule that was would be workable. So despite the Trump administration's uh, efforts to pull this back, um, we continue to see industry and states moving forward with a lot of the same plans um, that they were, were planning on pre-CPP right. and also um, once the CPP was rolling. Um, so then, what is the net effect of the Trump administration rolling back the Clean Power Plan? Does it have an impact when it comes to emissions reductions? Well, so let me just comment on the first part of that because th this is what a lot of people predicted and it actually makes sense given the way the Clean Air Act works because the Clean Air Act tells EPA, uh, don't make stuff up. Look at where industry is going, and especially where the leading industries are going that are reducing air. This is about air pollution, right? This is not about the energy system. This is about reducing air pollution. Uh, producing power um, produces air pollution, and certain kinds of, of uh, power production produce more than others. And there are ways to reduce that. So we looked at where the industry was going, and we built the rule based on that. So it makes all the sense in the world that that is turning out to be true. And there are certain many examples uh, uh, of that. Um, the rule is important, though, because it sends a signal to all of industry all across the country that this is the right direction for the, the industry to go to produce the good that it produces, in this case electricity, electrons, but to do so in a way that reduces the harm to public health and to the environment. You mentioned Paris. Mm -hmm. um, a week and a half ago, the Trump administration moved to exit the Paris Agreement. Obviously, that's going to take some time before that's um, in full effect. Um, what are the broader impacts of that? How does that impact what state and local governments here in the U.S. are going to be doing on emissions reductions? Does it play? Well, um, I was both um, 
uh, perturbed and not perturbed um, by the decision on Paris. Um, I don't think it was a surprise um, to many people that, that the president pulled out of the accord. In fact, given the signals that had been sent through these various actions, I think the surprise would have been, would have been the other way. Uh, the good news is that um, states, cities, and businesses are moving forward. Um, uh, there were 1,400 organizations and cities and universities that signed up for the We're Still In campaign on day one, and they can't keep up with all of that. In the part of the country where I come from, the Midwest, we have cities like East Lansing and Cincinnati and Indianapolis that are stepping up and saying, yes, we believe this is a responsibility of, of the United States, and we're going to move forward on it. And big, big companies um, from the Midwest as, 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 as well as all over the place. Um, on the other hand, um, I think there are some really significant downsides to the U.S. not being uh, part of the Paris Accord, uh, uh, assuming that that goes forward. Um, for one thing, we're handing over leadership of this incredibly important international issue um, to other countries, and in particular, China. And is that where the U.S. really wants to be? Is that where our businesses really want to be? Um, one of the um, important roles that EPA, in particular, um, uh, w was to play in the Paris Accord, um, it's a very sort of nerdy, wonky thing, um, but important, which is to provide technical assistance to countries to make sure that they are doing their reductions in a credible way, keeping track of them and accounting for them. And not all countries do that now the way we do and the way some of the, the, the countries in Europe do. Uh, they need to have resources and assistance to do that. So um, we want everybody's reductions to be credible and actual and real and accurate. And, um, and it's, it, not having the U.S. as part of that uh, is a real downside. The president indicated that he's willing to renegotiate or potentially sign on to a new plan. Do you see that as genuine uh, on his part, and do you see it as plausible on the international well, stage? I, I can't speak for his uh, his intentions. Um, uh, this was signed off on by a lot of countries, and um, it, it took a lot to get to that point. Um, and I, I think it would, will be difficult for one country to come back in and say, uh, no, we want a different deal. So lots of rollbacks. Mm -hmm. Do you think we could see some policies coming out of this administration, specifically on climate? CPP is rolled back. Could something replace it? Well, um, we've heard that they're going forward with something, um, although what we've heard is that it is a, it is a rollback um, uh, of the plan. Um, I'm sure there will be lots and lots of, of input um, from a whole variety of commenters on, um, on, on what that policy might look like. And, and really, when it comes right down to it, EPA's job is to implement the Clean Air Act. And, um, and will people feel that whatever this administration comes out with um, be um, fully fulfilling what Congress intended? And US EPA is um, also going to be giving states an extra year to uh, meet the ozone regulations that came out of the Obama administration. It's something that the business community has applauded. Does that extra year give stakeholders the time that they need to meet the targets um, and also continue to work towards meeting those regulations? Well, I, I tell you, I'm concerned about that decision. Um, the Clean Air Act uh, sets a schedule. Once the standard is revised, I mean, that reflects um, what the science shows is necessary to protect public health. And then it starts a whole chain of, uh, of steps that, that stretch out over many years, depending on how severely polluted an area is, in order to move that air quality there in the, in the right direction. Um, the administrator it can, can extend that time for a year um, if he or she doesn't have adequate data to, to make those decisions. Um, and it, it's not clear to me exactly what data the administrator based that on. Um, I think that the Clean Air Act provides plenty of time for the planning that people need to do in order to meet the standard. Um, I'm worried because um, we, we've seen the administrator say he's relooking at the 2015 ozone standard, um, and, and the situation is that we have people out there in the world um, breathing this air, and for many of them, it is causing them health problems, um, missed school, missed work. Uh, we've had ozone action days and ozone violations uh, across the country here for this hot weather here in June, um, and people are suffering. And so to delay implementation of that standard um, uh, has real cost in terms of public health. But again, business community is something that they had been pushing for, so two sides of, of the coin. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the budget. Okay. Um, 
Obviously, we've seen uh, some proposed significant budget cuts uh, to EPA coming out of the, the Trump budget. Um, you know, the agency has long been the focus um, for conservatives, um, for being too large, too many employees, too big of a workforce, um, costing too much money. Um, do you think we're at a moment right now where we should be taking a good look at um, how many people the agency employs, how much money is being spent? Um, perhaps the budget cuts are more dramatic than some would like to see, but should that be taken uh, a look at? Well, I think any responsible government is going to be looking on an ongoing basis at, at being the most efficient as, as they can be. Um, but people need to realize that EPA is, is smaller than when um, Obama came into office. There are several uh, thousand employees smaller um, than in the early days of the Obama administration. I think the entire um, budget of EPA is uh, about 0.3 percent of the federal budget. It is not a large agency. It is not overflowing. Um, and it has uh, very clear um, uh, tasks to do under the federal laws that Congress has set for it. Um, more work than it can do with the resources that it has. Um, and uh, keeping in mind it does this in partnership with the state agencies and the local agencies who implement a lot of the programs. And of course, significant reductions are proposed for those agencies as well. Um, so what this, this budget um, will result in less work being done on the ground, whether it's by uh, EPA or by state and federal agencies to protect public health, keep water clean, keep air clean, um, uh, do appropriate enforcement when people aren't abiding by the laws. It, there's just no question about it, it will. And we were talking before the show, one of the things that you're really concerned about is the R&D for uh, technology development um, and what might happen to, to that money. Well, I mean, the, the, this budget um, it takes very significant cuts on, on the science budget, not just at EPA, but at other agencies as well. I think it's about 50% cut at EPA. And, um, and that's where a lot of the work gets done so that people can understand the environmental uh, problems. You know, the, the, this budget uh, zeroes out money for the Great Lakes um, uh, uh, Restoration Initiative. And um, I couldn't come on your show representing uh, Environmental Law and Policy Center in the Midwest without speaking to that, and, and specifically. You know, it provides uh, drinking water for 48 million people. It's the third largest economy in, um, in the world. It's $7 billion in, in the fishing industry. And I learned, interestingly enough, of the 10 most uh, highly rated beers, five of them are made from water from the Great Lakes. So uh, the, the small amount of money that goes to those incredibly important projects at, in the Great Lakes and Chesapeake and, and uh, all communities across the country um, is really going to make a difference on the ground. And big cuts to efficiency programs as well, um, which uh, we chatted a bit earlier about. Um, do you think those will those cuts will have legs in, in Congress? Yeah, you know, I th well, I, I I don't know. I mean, I think the what we saw in the FY17 budget suggests that um, Congress is going to take its own look at the things that it thinks are important. Um, and uh, the efficiency programs, the voluntary programs that have really been through Republican and Democrat administrations, ways for businesses to shine, um, to, to have encouragement and recognition when they innovate um, and, and evolve, which is what we do in this country. We get better, we get cleaner, we get cheaper, we get, um, we get to, to, to serve people better. And everybody wants to do that. That's what makes people feel good and it's what makes makes them money. And for programs like Energy Star and Natural Gas Star and, and these uh, positive, encouraging, voluntary programs um, to, to be thought to be um, uh, le not useful, um, it would be a shame. All right. We will end it right there. Janet, thank you. Thank, thank you for you, your Monica. time. Nice to see you. Thank you. And thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.